Must the citizen ever for a moment, or in the least degree, resign his conscience to the legislator? Why has every man a conscience, then? I think that we should be men first, and subjects afterwards. It is not desirable to cultivate a respect for the law so much as for the right. The only obligation which I have a right to assume is to do at any time what I think is right. Quote, Henry David Thoreau in his essay entitled On the Duty of Civil Disobedience. What are your highest values? What violates your conscience? What is the line that a government must not cross? Most people do not ask themselves these questions. And when they don't, they find themselves to be far more capable of evil than they once realized. For every individual, the line will be different. For some, Almost any injustice by the government is an intolerable burden. For others, they are willing to suffer long. But whether you are the former or the latter, I would urge you to consider where that line is. It is in the non-considerate, those who lack self-awareness, that find themselves pushed far beyond what they could have imagined was possible. And before they know it, they are thrust into an abyss of suffering, nihilism, and desensitization. For many, the thought of such a line is the th furthest thing from their mind. Well, fair enough. We have plenty of worries and concerns to occupy our time with. And besides, what are the chances that your government will fully embrace totalitarianism? Why would we have to think? about such matters. I get it, and it's a fair point. But allow me to try to reframe your thinking on this just a little bit. If the history of human civilization was measured by a clock, your life is one movement of the second hand, while open, liberal democracies are a movement of the minute hand. An authoritarian, genocidal, perpetual war slave states represents every other second, minute, and hour of that clock. With such a calculation and a bird's eye view, it is not hard to see why it is now more important than ever to resist the mission creep of government expansion over our health, safety, and finances. Human freedom and prosperity is but a few seconds on that clock, and there is certainly no guarantee it will maintain such a trajectory indefinitely. For it is indeed the exception, not the rule, of our sordid history. Therefore, it is incumbent upon us, we who were born in such a situation, to be ever more vigilant to defend and pass on the values of liberty, equality, and justice to our children and our children's children, lest this exceedingly rare commodity of freedom be lost to the annals of history. There are a number of ways we can maintain the progress that was so hard to attain in the first place. One such measure is violence. Civil war, unrest, rioting, and looting is certainly one method in which we could resist tyrannical dictators and authoritarian despots. Though I would prefer not to live through that, the price to pay for such a method is indeed high and perhaps not worth the cost. Not only that, every revolution seems to produce a despot worse than his predecessor. Though I cannot entirely rule out violence, I do believe we must do all that we can 
with all of our will, strength, and fortitude to topple dictators without shedding a single drop of blood. One such method that has been more or less successful is nonviolent civil disobedience. The word civil in civil disobedience is meant to denote an attitude and strategy that does not employ the use of violence, but rather, in a civilized way, is meant to use disobedience as a method to frustrate the efforts of injustice, making it too costly to enforce or to garner public support. This form of nonviolent resistance is actually relatively new in regards to human history, though certainly there are probably examples of it in antiquity. Its formation as a socio-political concept is novel. The use of civil disobedience as a strategy for resisting governments has skyrocketed over the last two centuries. Some may call displays of non-compliance theatrical, naive, or unhelpful. Others will say we should change things through the political process, not by being disruptive or causing inconvenience. If these are your objections, I would ask you to consider some of the data that researchers have uncovered in recent years as it pertains to civil disobedience. In her book, Why Civil Resistance Works, Erica Chenoweth details how, from 1900 to present day, nonviolent protests and uprisings are twice as likely to successfully achieve their goals as violent ones. They find that insurgencies, coups, and the like are successful one out of four times, while civil disobedience and nonviolent resistance is successful three out of four times. Some of the most notable examples of this method being effective are the Iranian Revolution of 1979, the Palestinian Intifada of 87, the Philippines People Power Revolution in 83, and the Burmese Uprising in 88. There are few names more iconic in the world of civil disobedience than Mahatma Gandhi. Born to a Hindu family in India, he would later become a devout follower of Jainism and strict adherence to vegetarianism and nonviolence. Educated as a lawyer in London, he eventually moved to South Africa to practice law. It was here that he would encounter vicious racism at the hands of white South Africans, ultimately launching his career as an activist. On one instance during litigation, Gandhi was asked to remove his turban. He refused to do so and was kicked out of the courtroom. This began to color his view of the world and of the society in which he lived. But the straw that broke the camel's back was on June 7, 1893, when he was boarding a train to Pretoria. Mahatma had purchased a ticket to ride first class. Another white passenger objected to his presence and demanded he be removed and placed to the back of the train. He refused. This caused a commotion where the train security told him he would have to move to the back of the train or be removed. Still obstinate, he stood his ground and was forced off the train at the next stop. From this moment on, the lawyer-turned-activist vowed he was going to fight racist laws and injustice, even if it meant great suffering for himself. Motivated by discrimination he experienced, Gandhi began his career as an activist forming a political party called the Natal Indian Congress in South Africa. To represent Indians in the country, and fight for racial equality. One of the biggest and most prominent fights was against a bill that was introduced to the Natal Legislative Assembly that would prohibit Indian citizens of South Africa 
the right to vote. Though he would ultimately go on to lose the fight, it did make him something of a hero within the civil rights movement at the time, and gained him international prominence. By 1906, Gandhi had organized his first mass civil disobedience campaign. The South African government had introduced legislation that would further restrict the rights of Indians in the country, including not recognizing Hindu marriage as legitimate and a poll tax that applied only to Indians. Gandhi rallied his volunteers and they engaged in what he called Satyagraha, which was a combination of two Sanskrit words, satya, meaning truth, and agraha, which meant holding firmly. Gandhi described the doctrine as follows. Quote, I have drawn the distinction between passive resistance, as understood and practiced in the West, and satyagraha, before I had evolved the doctrine of the latter to its full logical and spiritual extent. I often used passive resistance and satyagraha as synonymous terms. But as the doctrine of satyagraha developed, the expression passive resistance ceases even to be synonymous, as passive resistance has admitted of violence as in the case of the suffragettes, and has been universally acknowledged to be a weapon of the weak. Moreover, passive resistance does not necessarily involve complete adherence to truth under every circumstance. Therefore, it is different from satyagraha in three essentials. Satyagraha is a weapon of the strong. It admits of no violence under any circumstance whatsoever, and it ever insists upon truth. End quote. Over the years of engaging in this practice, he and his followers were arrested on multiple occasions, and though their sacrifice was great, they began to gain sympathy from the public and the rest of the world, making the South African government look worse by the day. Then finally, in 1913, the government relented and agreed to compromise with the Natal Indian Congress, allowing for Hindu marriage and abolishing the poll tax. In 1914, just before the outbreak of World War I, the civil rights leader returned to India and lived a pious lifestyle of fasting, prayer, and simplicity. Here he founded an ashram in the country where he invited people of all castes to pray and meditate. The war had ended and Mahatma had been living in India for five years, practicing his religion when the government of India under British rule at the time enacted the so-called Rowlett Act, which authorized British soldiers to arrest anyone who was under suspicion of sedition without trial. Gandhi found this intolerable and once again called for Satyagraha to hold peaceful protests and strikes against this law. The Crown was quick to quell the protests with violent reprisals, and on April 13, 1919, British soldiers mowed down a crowd of peaceful protesters with machine guns, killing nearly 400. The event would later be called the Massacre of Amritsar. It incensed Gandhi, and he renounced his British citizenship, even returning the medals he earned while serving the UK military in a non-combat role. The events in Amritsar would ultimately be a thorn in the empire's side, as it sparked an independence movement unlike India had ever seen. It was called uh, the Indian Home Rule Movement, ostensibly led by Gandhi. Rebellion spread like wildfire throughout the land. Students stopped attending government schools, 
Indian soldiers abandoned their military posts. Citizens stopped paying taxes to the crown and boycotted British products. Mahatma was so committed to this, he even refused to wear English garb, opting to produce his own clove. This is where his iconic shawl, known as a dowdy, came from. In 1922, Gandhi was arrested for, and pleaded guilty to, charges of sedition, for which he spent two years in jail. For the remainder of the 20s, the activists would keep a low profile. That is, until Britain introduced the Salt Acts of 1930. A law that prohibited Indians from collecting or selling salt and imposed a heavy tax on the commodity. Yet again, Mahatma was thrown into the limelight to protest the injustice, coordinating yet another Satyagraha. The Salt March was a 390-kilometer walk to the coast of the Arabian Sea, where he and a few dozen of his followers would illegally collect salt, defying British law. Word of this symbolic act spread, and thousands would come out to meet him day after day, where he would lead prayers and give speeches. Finally, when he arrived at the shore, where he would begin to indefinitely mine and collect salt out of shore deposits. British soldiers met him there and destroyed most of the deposits. But this would not deter Gandhi, as he would take piles of mud and sand out of the ground and separate the salt. Over the coming days, tens of thousands of protesters and Indian nationalists would attend and also begin work on illegally harvesting salt. Gandhi, along with 60,000 others, were arrested for their demonstration. This only inflamed the movement and launched Mahatma into international stardom, even appearing on the cover of Time magazine. He spent several months in prison, and the Satyagraha raged on into the early months of 1931. After his release in January of that year, progress had been made with the British authorities to make concessions on harvesting salt. Though the Salt Acts were not entirely appeal, repealed, they were amended to allow residents of the coast to continue salt collecting activities. The activists would once again abstain from politics, leaving the Indian National Contra Congress and returning to his work with the poor. He would, however, not be out of the limelight for long. By the 1940s, the United Kingdom had entered into World War II, dragging India along with it. By this time, the British Empire had long been receding as many of its colonies and vassal states were campaigning for independence, and India was no exception. Along with this was the financial toll that the war took on the empire. It became ever more difficult to maintain its grip on its clients as they demanded autonomy. Gandhi started the Quit India movement, which mobilized protests for independence. Mahatma was once again in hot water, and by order of Winston Churchill himself, he found himself behind bars. He spent two years in jail, and his w health was frail. But finally, after Churchill had been defeated in an election, the new Labour government was much more open to meeting India's demands. After negotiations, it was finally agreed to allow India to secede from the British Empire. But one of the terms was to split the country in two, the northern part made up of majority Muslims, now Pakistan, and the southern part made up of majority Hindus and Sikhs, now India. Much of the reason for the split along these lines were religious as there was already much violence in the country between the Hindus and the Muslims, hoping to avoid a civil war once the British left. 
After independence, Gandhi continued his work advocating for peace, except now between the sectarian violence that existed in India between its two major religions. Gandhi, who himself was a Hindu, had attempted to reach out to Muslims and was seen publicly embracing and speaking with them. This enraged some of the more extreme elements of the Hindu Indians, and they viewed this as a betrayal, ultimately assassinating Gandhi with three gunshot wounds to the chest. A violent end to the man who is most well known for never employing violence to achieve his ends. Though his journey concluded in a somewhat ironic way, Gandhi's impact would no less be felt around the world. Being one of the only founding fathers of a modern nation that was not born in violence or revolution. Demonstrating that it is possible to secede from imperial powers, central governments, and tyrannical rulers without firing a bullet. Conscientious Objection The Act of Refusing Military Service because of a belief in the injustice of the war you are fighting, or if it violates one's religious convictions. It differed from Satyagraha in that it often did not involve the organization of any type of mass protest movement or public demonstration. It was generally only one individual who would object. And in many ways this was much braver than mass protest movements as you can be singled out by public opinion, institutions, community, and even your family. Often, during peacetime, it is hard to remember the kinds of social and governmental pressures that exist during wartime, as the beginnings of conflicts are rife with what can only be described as propaganda to support your government's war efforts. Some objectors, like Desmond Doss, simply refuse to bear arms or engage in combat with the enemy, opting to serve in a non-combat role, like a medic, cook, or technician. Still, others like Muhammad Ali chose not to serve in the military in any capacity, resulting in the stripping of his championship belt and jail time. The way I see it, conscientious objection could be defined even broader than just refusing military service. Though the dictionary describes it only in a military context, I believe the word can apply to police officers who refuse to enforce unjust laws, medical practitioners who refuse to participate in a medical procedure they find morally egregious, and even employees who in- refuse to engage in behavior that violates their conscience. Objectors the world over risk life and limb in pursuit of truth and justice. Civil disobedience movements are still going strong and are desperately needed in many repressive regimes across the globe. I must stress that it is necessary as much in so-called Western countries as it is in Asian, Latin American, African, or Arabic countries. The more we engage in and use disobedience as an alternative to civil war, the better it is for everybody. Often, simply by frustrating the efforts of governments to oppress their own people, it can make enforcement of said policies too costly both politically and financially. As I am writing this, there is an ongoing protest movement in Iran over the murder by police forces of Masa Amini, a young woman who was arrested over improperly wearing her hijab. So far, hundreds of people have died in clashes with the police, and thousands have been arrested and awaiting trial. 
In my country of Canada, we experienced one of the largest protests in recent memory called the Freedom Convoy. The movement was sparked by Justin Trudeau's government's decision to apply vaccine mandates to cross-border trucking, one of the least likely frontline workers to catch or spread respiratory illnesses as the vast majority of time spent on the job is alone in a truck. Thousands of big rig trucks to small cars to farm vehicles formed a convoy that began in British Columbia and drove all the way to the capital city of Ottawa. This was perhaps only the straw that broke the camel's back, however, as frustrations and tensions had been growing for well over a year over the draconian, backwards, and unscientific restrictions and vaccine mandates. The convoy made its way to Ottawa and occupied the streets in and around Parliament Hill, refusing to leave or remove their vehicles in an act of non-violent civil disobedience. A demonstration unlike Canada has ever seen. Despite a cacophony of disinformation spread by both the government and government-funded media entities, to intentionally turn public opinion against the protesters, and despite reprisals from the government, the political fallout was swift. Within days across the country, vaccine requirements and public health restrictions were being rescinded left and right in every province across the nation. Though there was certainly a price to pay for the events, they were able to achieve many of their goals without throwing a single fist. And in spite of protesters being rammed by cars, brutalized by police, having their bank accounts illegally frozen, and being slandered by cynical politicians and media outlets, their efforts were nothing short of heroic. It has to be said that not all protest movements have a happy ending. This is especially true for movements that turn violent or begin civil wars. The outcomes are almost never positive. In late 2010, a Tunisian man by the name of Mohamed Bouzizi committed suicide by self-immolation in the middle of a market to protest local authorities who destroyed his business. This sparked a movement across Tunisia, which would ultimately overthrow the government. But it was not contained to this country alone. It spread like wildfire, excuse the metaphor, throughout the Arab world, causing the collapse of governments in Egypt, Libya, and Syria, among others, in what is now called the Arab Spring. In the power vacuums that were created, Many Muslim extremist groups established themselves as the the new ruling regime, not the least of which was Al-Qaeda. Many NATO countries like the US, France, Russia, and even Canada saw this as an opportunity to extend their security and economic interests in the region, using intelligence agencies like the CIA to fund and arm their preferred rebel groups and orchestrate coups to overthrow leaders like Muammar Gaddafi from Libya and Bashir al-Assad in Syria. ISIS, most likely, would have been nothing more than a poorly funded terrorist group if not for the United States' money and weapons being funneled to them in order to depose Assad. The civil wars that followed as a direct result of the Arab Spring killed millions and caused the most severe refugee crisis since World War II, a problem that much of Europe is still paying for today. Violent anti-government resistance is almost never worth the price, and in most cases, countries end up in a worse place than when they started. Though there are rare examples of what one might call a successful revolution, like the American Revolutionary War, 
history is unfortunately riddled with far more instances of uprisings that make life far worse for far more people than before. Examples like the reign of terror after the French Revolution, the rise of the genocidal Soviet Union after the Russian Revolution, or murderous mass killings and starvation carried out by Mao's Cultural Revolution. The way I see it, civil disobedience is evolution, not revolution. It is refusing to engage in the millennia-old story of violence, instead choosing a better way forward for humanity, showing us all that the way of bloodshed is antiquated, and there is indeed a better path. As the renowned American civil rights leader Martin Luther King Jr. once quipped, If we do an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, the whole nation will be blind and toothless.